Hope everyone's doing well today. Welcome to Coach's Connection. I am very excited to introduce our speakers for today, Michael Supp and Steve Fell, who are with Beyond Pulse. They will discuss the invention that Beyond Pulse is and what it is doing within the game in the United States, as well as going around the topic of periodization and the role it plays in the game of football and soccer. Enjoy. All right. So I wanted to kind of uh, uh, appreciate everyone for taking the time to join us during this uh, um, unique time um, to kind of sit in and listen on what Beyond Pulse has uh, put together. I think it is a very unique uh, time with this COVID-19 pandemic. I hope everyone's staying healthy and safe. And uh, before I give uh, Michael and Steve the floor, I wanted to kind of uh, just discuss before we get into the Q&A, just to stay on track and we can kind of end it at three, is um, I'm going to answer all your questions on your behalf. So anytime you feel like you have a question, by the time we get to the Q&A, please send it via message and I will ask it on your part and kind of hopefully from you guys, you guys get what you want and take the notes and um, good. From there, I'll give the floor to... Steve and Mike, all is yours. Brilliant. Th thank you very much, Sean. Uh, I'm just going to share. I'm going to be sharing my screen right now. Okay. Can, uh, can everybody see? I've got a little slide deck up here. Um, can you see that, Sean and, and Steve? Just a Perfect. thumbs up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Magic. Magic. All right. We're working. We're live. We're off. So, uh, yeah. Thank you, Sean. Uh, thanks for inviting us. Uh, my name is Michael Sup. I'm one of the co-founders of Beyond Pulse. Uh, I've got Steve Fell with me here, who uh, who is going to uh, have the opportunity to introduce himself here shortly. Uh, Steve is also a member of the Beyond Pulse family, uh, and, and we're very lucky to have him. Um, Sean has asked us to to do a presentation around uh, periodization. Uh, you know, what is it? What does it look like? How does it all work? Uh, some of you may have an understanding of it already. Great. Uh, having someone like Steve on the call is, is going to be able to take you to the next level of your understanding, no matter where you're at. Uh, and that will be the focus of the call, um, or, or of this webinar and of this uh, presentation. I just want to spend a few minutes at the beginning to just share with you all, uh, who are beyond pulse, what are beyond pulse, why are we delivering a presentation to you all on, on periodization? Uh, and I think once you have that understanding, uh, it'll make sense as to uh, to who we are and why Sean has invited us to come on here to present. Um, so Beyond Pulse, uh, what is it? It's, 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 it's really simple. It's wearable technology, but actually we would call ourselves an education company. We would call ourselves a coaching education company uh, because we wanted to design and implement wearable technology specifically for youth sports organizations. Um, and that's something that's not typically been done in the past. It's, it's only ever typically been done at professional elite level. Um, and so Beyond Pulse is about how do we take that technology and apply it to youth and one of the lessons that we can learn from that. Uh, and our why is, is very, very simple. We want to help coaches coach better. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. When, when you boil it all down, uh, we believe that with some pretty simple and objective data that's easily captured, uh, from the field instantly, uh, we can really help coaches coach better. Uh, and one of the main metrics that we track, one of the main metrics that we uh, try to show this with is, is called active participation. What is active participation? It's really simple. Basically, it shows at the end of a training session how much time were your players actually moving versus being stood still? How much time were they physically active versus being inactive? Why is this so important? Well, because we know that for, sorry, we know that in youth sports, we know that in youth sports, it's a big, big problem. We know that in, uh, sorry folks, we know that in youth sports, it's a, a really big problem uh, with inactivity. Uh, and a reason why kids actually stop playing is because it becomes uh, boring, they're sitting in these long lines, coaches are talking, they're, they're lecturing at them for entire sessions, 
and, and we know that it's a it's an issue in youth sports and, and a reason why a lot of kids actually end up dropping out so active participation for us is, is really simple in a 90 minute practice how much time are they moving we believe that it should be around 75 percent we believe that ball rolling time time on task uh, a few different countries call it different things. It's based on that concept and it should be around three quarters of the session. Um, and so what we've been able to do is we've been able to actually see, okay, well, what does that look like for clubs? And, and what I'm sharing with you here is uh, Midwest United. Uh, this is a report from their fall uh, season from about 12 weeks in, in the fall. And you can see here on the left-hand side, every single team that's using the belts and we just give a weekly average. What was their weekly active participation uh, from their three or four training sessions during the week? And you can see here really clearly at the beginning, if we look at the O2 Royal team, for example, week 33, average activity time was 50%. Week 34 was 48%, 54%, 52%, 51%. Nearly half the session, kids are not moving. They are being stood still. This is a coaching issue. Um, yes, there is some player responsibility. There is, of course, some accountability for players in this. But we firmly believe that this is a reflection of coaching. And that is why we would call ourselves a coaching education company, because we are committed to trying to improve this and trying to improve the environment upon which kids are, are participating, learning, growing, and, and developing. Um, and this is why, this is one way in which we feel we're a little bit different as to how. Uh, technology is really being used and applied in, in sports in general. Um, so a active participation is, is a big piece of our why. Now, does that apply to everybody? No. We work with a lot of BA, ECNL, you know, high-level teams. We work with a lot of college programs as well and, and even a couple of pro professional teams too. Steve is using the Bells to Phoenix Rising where, where he's currently at. And, of course, active participation there isn't so much a problem. And that's when you can obviously use the data, you can use the technology more towards a periodized planning uh, perspective. And, and, and that's where a lot of uh, higher level teams are at. And that's kind of what Steve is gonna go into here is how can we use some of this data to periodize our training plans, our seasons for, uh, for youth teams. Um, very quickly, I'm just gonna show you what the technology actually is. So it's, it's a belt that players wear around their chest. It, it's kind of like a heart rate monitor, except it's got a, an accelerometer inside it as well. So with that, we're able to get a combination of uh, internal load, as in heart rate, uh, but also external load relative to players' movement. So active participation, as we've talked about, distance, speed. Uh, we've got a workload metric, number of sprints, etc. So players wear the belt, and then it's all, uh, it's all done through an app. You don't need to plug these in. There's no briefcase by the side of the field with a laptop. Uh, you don't need to download the data. It is all wirelessly done through Bluetooth uh, and through a phone. Coaches have an app on their phone that allows them to connect and sync with multiple belts at the same time, uh, an entire team's work, if you will. And then players also have the player app, which they can use to record their sessions at home which of course is kind of fitting given what's going, currently going on with you know, every kid in the country training at home. We're still very active with the On Pulse because we've now got a few thousand kids at home with their belts using the player app and that information is going back to the club, back to their coaches who are able to see uh, some very tangible data as to what kids are actually doing. Here's an example of an email that kids would get uh, straight after the session, coaches and players get. Uh, within seconds after the app stops at the end of the practice, and it gives a quick overview of the uh, of the data. What what I wanted to show you is just a, a quick example of what weekly reports look like. And as we start to get into the periodization discussion with Steve, um, you know, some of the data that we present on a weekly basis is, is really cool in being able to uh, potentially monitor those things. So here's an example of a, of a player. This is an anon anonymous name. Jane Doe, Jane Doe doesn't exist. But this is real data from, uh, from East Meadows Soccer Club out on Long Island. So we show uh, each day, Monday through Sunday, what was the duration of their session. We show uh, heart rate, specifically how many minutes did the player spend working in what's called their red zone, time above 80% of their max heart rate. We show their active minutes. So in a 39-minute in a session, 
how much of that time were they actually moving? So 32 out of the 39 minutes they were active. What was their distance covered? And we have a workload metric as well, uh, which is a combination of their distance and high speed running, number of sprints, uh, and it's measured in what's called trims, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. Um, and then we just give a guideline as to what constitutes low, moderate, and vigorous for each of those metrics at the bottom here. So kids themselves can really start to get a handle on what they're doing each week. Uh, and especially now, <laughs> especially now when they're all being prescribed programs, uh, coaches can, can, can start to prescribe uh, low uh, and intensity of those sessions to the kids. Uh, and they can actually have some, again, some data that they can use to then reflect on, well, how did I do? Did I, did I do a hard session today? Uh, was, was today's session a lighter session? Did, do my numbers reflect that? So this is what players see. Uh, it's kind of fun for coaches now because as coaches uh, of a team or teams, they now get a weekly report that shows you each player in the team, Monday through Sunday, what was their active minutes or did they not train? That's the DNTs you see in here, means did not train uh, with their belt. And they also see heart rate. So we show the active minutes and the heart rate information, uh, a combination of the two. And then if you're a director of coaching that's got your club using this and you've got multiple teams, well, we give you a, a team level view as well. So you can see uh, a team by team case of active minutes and again, team by team for heart rate information. So what we're finding right now is it's, it's generating a lot of really cool intra-club uh, uh, competition based on, uh, based on their active minutes and, and their heart rate, which is my final point connected nicely to our national leaderboard that we currently have win. I'm going to play a, a quick video here in the background. There's no sound. Uh, well, there is sound, but you're not going to hear it, but it's just some cheesy music anyway. Uh, but just to get a, a sense of, of the current climate with what we're doing uh, in the Active Minutes project. So basically, uh, players are training with their belts at home. Everyone's doing their stuff at home right now. The kids are putting on their belts. Really simple. Goes around the chest. They open up their app and they start recording their session with their belt. And then they go ahead and they do their activities. Kids are doing stuff uh, all over the country right now. And then at the end, they simply stop their session. They get their data immediately. But what's really cool is this data goes directly back to, uh, to the club and to the coaches. And we have national leaderboards that are running. Uh, we've got a club leaderboard. So you can see here, East Meadow uh, uh, are at the top of our national leaderboard for active minutes. You've got Midwest STA. Baltimore Armour, which is a club Steve's working with on our behalf uh, as well. Uh, and Michigan Fire Juniors are in the top five. We then give a, a player leaderboard. So we've got kids across the country competing with their active minutes. And then we show a team leaderboard as well. So uh, and our teams are, uh, are having the chance to compete with one another. Uh, and then we give away prizes. We've got Nike soccer prizes that are going out. Uh, Ductic brand, session planners, uh, a group you may be familiar with as well. Um, so this is something that's going on right now with the Active Minutes project, uh, which we're, we're kind of enjoying uh, in, in encouraging that activity at home and, and an opportunity for kids to take their training to the next level. Um, and, you know, when they return to play, when everything goes back to normal, you know, they just uh, they take their belts with them and they, they start using their belts again when they're, when they're working as a team. Uh, and that's when the idea of, you know, periodization planning for clubs, for coaches, for teams is something that's becoming more and more popular uh, at the youth sports level, especially for, for more organized uh, and advanced level clubs. And that is when I'm going to pass over to Mr. Steve Fell, who is going to uh, deliver a, a nice presentation for you all around that topic um, but again, I wanted to just give a bit of context beyond Pulse, who we are, what we do, and hopefully now uh, you, you can see a little bit more as to why we're presenting on periodization, because it's very much in, in the interest of what we're doing uh, relative to youth sports across the country and, and beyond. Um, so I guess any questions, Sean, if anyone has any questions specific to beyond Pulse, we'll, we'll save those for the end as well, in addition to, uh, in addition to Steve. Uh, and uh, and the topic and the slides he's going to go through here. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. Magic. Thank you. All right. 
Cool. So this says this says youth soccer athlete. Uh, I don't know what everybody's current situation is, but you can apply any of these principles to the whole spectrum. So um, I, I was assuming that most of uh, everyone that was in here today is maybe working with with youth, but uh, if not, you know, it's not no big deal. You can you can take any of these concepts and, and apply it. Okay. All right. So my, uh, my name is Steve Fell. I am currently the Director of Performance uh, here at Phoenix Rising. Um, we are, like everybody, we're, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern. We are actually supposed to get back to training next, next Monday in groups of four. So I know uh, the technical staff and the players are, are really excited to get out and try and be creative and get a little something done. I think there's going to be ma massive challenges, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So not to bore you guys with this, but that was just a little bit about my background. Um, prior to this, I was with Houston Dynamo uh, in Major League Soccer and also worked with the U.S. youth national teams, U19, U20 level. Um, and then prior to that, in the collegiate setting at a small Division II school um, is where I really kind of got my, my start. So that's a little bit about myself. Uh, and today, guys, you know, I'll, I'll try and I don't want it to be uh, super long. It, it, sometimes this can get it can get drawn out. I don't want to lose anybody's attention. Uh, but basically, these are uh, some of the objectives that I have or hope that you guys will be able to kind of take away from this presentation. And I encourage uh, everyone who has a question to just ask right away, you know, as opposed to waiting, uh, you know, maybe we get to it. Maybe we, maybe we don't. However, Sean wants to do that, but um, you know, this, the more interaction I, I like uh, versus me just being a talking head. So uh, just know that up front. Okay. So these are four pillars. I'm sure most of you are, are very familiar with, okay. The, the pillars that, that soccer athletes are built upon and, you know, that includes the, the tactical, technical, psychological, and physical. And I think, I think in, in years past, and, you know, certainly, certainly when I was playing, uh, a lot of these uh, elements were kind of siloed, you know, uh, or maybe technical, tactical were, were kind of lumped in together. And, you know, physical was something that was, that was, you know, coaches know, know you needed, but, you know, how do you, you know, uh, how do you supplement that? And, and, uh, in, in a way that's going to help enhance performance rather than just add a bunch of load and, and potential risk to, to the athletes. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, just the, the blending of, of, of this or what's, what's been labeled as tactical periodization. Uh, that's a term that some of you may be familiar with, uh, but and it's basically just a, you know, a, a term used to, you know, tie in all these components uh, within, within football to, to maximize uh, performance on game day. Okay. So I like this slide, you know, I think a lot of, I think there's a lot of misconception, uh, or a lot of, you know, false information with regards to like, what is it that, that soccer athletes need, you know, as, with regards to, uh, you know, being able to do the work that's required to play at, at, at any level really. And, you know, speaking to a lot of people, it's like, ah, they need, they need to be some, you know, athletes that run and they can run forever. And, you know, yes, that is part of that is true. However, um, you know, soccer is unique in that it, it requires uh, physical abilities on all ends of the spectrum. So I'd like to ask this question. Uh, sorry about that. The dogs are going a little crazy. Uh, I'd like to ask the question, where does an athlete fall on this continuum? And a lot of, I get a lot of mixed answers. And, you know, for me, you know, it falls right in the middle. Okay. So athletes need to have the ability to, to do a lot of work, you know, and have a good aerobic system, but they also need to be able to be powerful and strong or be strong and which is going to allow athletes to be powerful. So um, this is a little slide that I like to look at and I, you know, aerobic capacity and power is, is critical uh, for players, both male and female, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the big reasons is um, you, you got to be able to turn over the your ability to produce explosive actions, whether that's an acceleration, a deceleration, a shot, um, a tackle, whatever, however you want to think about it. You know, this the aerobic system uh, is going to uh, enable one to 
do it over and over and over again in short in short succession, which is uh, which is critical when you're talking about the you know top players or top teams in the world. They're able to do these explosive actions repeatedly and often through a 90 minute session or a 90 minute match, which which is uh, which is critical, especially when we're talking about scoring goals. You know. The, the big one that I always get here is this, this anaerobic capacity and power. You know, people think about that as like, uh, you know, anaerobic, it's, it's when your legs are blowing up and you're over breathing heavy and, you, you know, you just, you're dying. And a lot of people think that's where you need to train all the time. Um, when in reality, that's, that's, that's really not what the game demands. Uh, it's well, and we'll go to another slide in here in a second, but soccer is a very aerobic, a lactic sport. So a lactic is an, is an anaerobic component, but the a lactic nature is in that you're not building up a lot of byproduct um, with that. Okay. So the idea that we need to train into this uh, state that's super, super glycolytic or super, super heavy um, and build up all this byproduct in, in, in our body is at times, yes, important. Uh, but I think we spend too much time there just in general. Uh, and it's really not what the demand, the games demand. There are times that you need to train it. Not, there are times you need to extend it. But I think we're, I think a lot of people are there more often than what they need to be, which is a very, which can be very difficult uh, on the player and, and pose a lot of risk and actually, you know, go into matches in, in a fatigue state, which is, which is definitely not what you want. Uh, when you're talking about trying to optimize performance and, and minimize risk of injury. And the last two things down there is strength and mobility. So, you know, strength is the underpinning factor that allows us to express power. And we're always after explosive actions in football. So if you have an underlying max strength uh, foundation, you're going to be able to, you know, produce power, more powerful actions more effectively, more efficiently, and repeatedly throughout a match than if you – don't have that foundation. So that's critical strength training, you know, whether it be supplemental or, and, in, and, or on the field is absolutely essential uh, to being able to be able to produce these explosive actions. And then finally, just the mobility, you know, people say flexibility. That's, that's a, that's, that term's okay. You know, it's um, it's more, you know, you need to, you need to be able to move well uh, in all joints uh, in all planes of motion, but you also need to have the neuromuscular control and the ability to to control um, that joint range. So uh, all these all these components are can't be siloed. They are 100% integrated into the athlete, and when you can optimize each piece uh, in, in an integrated fashion, I think I think you give the athlete from a physical standpoint the, the greatest opportunity to express the technical tactical abilities. So. Physical demands uh, of football are it's intermittent in nature. You have low periods of low intensity work, okay, and then you have with brief bouts of high intensity actions that have to be repeated. Again, you know the, those low periods of, of low intensity work are what is going to fuel these abilities to be very explosive, uh, more repeatedly and often throughout the entire match. You know, team players that can maintain a certain tempo, a high tempo for the, the duration of the match, and not let the quality of that drop are always going to be the most dangerous and um, the most effective for, for coaches. So that's the idea. So the takeaway, takeaway here, we've, we've talked a little bit about, but it's, you know, it's best classified soccer that is football is, you know, an aerobic a lactic sport, meaning they need a good aerobic engine to, that, and to, and also to be able to be powerful, uh, you know, with, within the confines of that aerobic system. Um, Anaerobic glycolysis, meaning operating on the presence without oxygen is important, but it's not the most important. And this is where, you know, I think as a, um, you know, in, in a lot of youth organizations, you know, the idea of uh, parents watching, you know, they need to see the kids working, they need to see the kids dying, uh, you know, from intense activity uh, because, oh, they're getting a hard workout. Well, anybody could do that. Anybody can, can crush a kid, can crush an athlete and make them tired. I mean, that does that anyone, anyone can. And the idea there is I think an education to the parents and an education to the athletes that, you know, there are times where you need to push and overload. And there are times where you need to reset and, and not, and, and do it with a purpose. And I think when we understand that we don't always need to be in this glycolytic anaerobic state, um, 
you know, you're going to start to see a lot of gains in a, in a positive way uh, from a tactical, tactical standpoint. So, and then the final piece here is that speed, being fast is critical in, the, in decisive moments. And, and, you know, being fast is very difficult when under fatigue. Um, you, you have a lot of decreases from, you know, basically the brain telling the body what it needs to do at a moment in time. And that delay doesn't allow you to be as effective and fast. It also doesn't allow you to, you know, put force into the ground in the right direction uh, optimally, which, which again, you know, takes away from, from optimizing performance. So you can see how it all kind of ties in, you know, uh, how the physical can a lot of times dictate a lot of these factors um, when you're talking about optimizing performance from a technical, tactical standpoint. All right, not a bad play there. So where do we go from here? All right. So I think the the big thing for me, you know, you never ever take, um, you know, a physical preparation coach or a fitness coach can can never, you know, work in isolation from a technical staff. And what I mean by that is, if if you have, if you're lucky to have a strength coach or a a, a physical preparation coach that you work with or on staff, you know, they they it is imperative that they understand what your style of play is, what the, what are the principles that guide that, um, you know, a clear definition is it about development is it about winning and then club mission and values. And this is critical because, um, when you are unable to have those conversations and unable to, uh, tie in the, the physical side, it quickly gets lost, um, within this. So uh, I put style of play up there because, you know, a team that maybe sits in is going to look very different than a team that likes to go forward and attack. And positionally, that's going to look much different as well. So having that understanding as a, as a, as a fitness coach or, or strength coach or performance coach, whatever label you want to give it uh, is absolutely critical when it comes to session design from both daily, weekly and monthly. Uh, and when you have that, and you can you can tie those principles in and, and develop some activities to to get across some principles. Now you're now you're really starting to integrate the, the physical, technical, tactical, psychological aspects uh, of of the game. And I, I put this picture up here. This is Brandon Harrison of Philly. He's a guy that I had the opportunity to work with when I was with the U19s, um, and he was uh, he had not broken into the MLS. He broke into the MLS literally a month after I got to, you know, work with him. Not not because of me by any means, but just he was a he was a he was a great, really good player and just super super hungry. And the, I know that they do a great job over there at, at the Philadelphia Union as far as development, and they have these style of play guiding principles and philosophies and you know ironed out. And the guy is absolutely on fire here in year two uh, before this COVID nineteen struck. So. Uh, really pleased to see that and I think it's a great testament to what uh, an organized system and structure from in all asset all facets can uh, can help develop a, a player so you know I'm sure you guys know about this moments of the game you know so um, tactical periodization you know I'll just read this from Raymond Verhan uh, you know football training periodization is a way to develop the top 15 as well as the best injury prevention tool out there. And I really like that quote because fatigue, fatigue accumulation equals the largest in injury risk. And what that means is, you know, that, that is a sound principle when we talk about strength and conditioning, you know, progressive overload, rest well, recover higher above your higher than your baseline. And too often we neglect the rest period. We, we neglect the period that's required for adaptation. Um, and, and footballers are going to accumulate this fatigue the most on the field. So as a, as a staff um, and coaches, we have some ability to, to dictate that and, and help them uh, not only minimize any type of injury risk, but help them, moving in the, help them move in the right direction to become the best player that they, that they, can, that they can be. Um, fatigue accumulation equals the largest injury risk. And that's where a lot of this monitoring stuff is really cool because it can give you some objective in, insight as to, you know, where, where they are actually. And it allow, can allow you to reflect on your processes to see if you need to make some changes because of this potential fatigue accumulation. So these are, these are principles, you know, volume versus intensity. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, volume is, uh, think about minutes played. 
you know, 90 minutes is, is more volume than 60 minutes, you know? So in theory, okay. And you know, if you're playing for 90 minutes, the idea is your intensity, okay. The number of actions per minute, um, the level of intensity that a player is playing with is going to be lower than if the duration is 60 minutes. And that's, that's, that makes sense, right? You know, the, the shorter your duration, the more intense your actions can be, the more actions you can do in a minute before onset of fatigue. Um, so those two volume and intensity is something I always think about because they're inversely proportional, meaning as one is high, the other should be low, lower. And as the other one, you know, if volume is high, intensity is naturally going to be a little bit lower, but the quality of the intensity, it, the quality of the movement, the quality of the actions are still high. So uh, I'm just talking about the number that you're going to do in a source session. And then these specific adaptation to impose demands, that's, a, that's another, you know, tried and true principle in the strength conditioning world. And that just says you get better at what you do. You know, so I think a lot of times, uh, you know, footballers, you know, you want to, they want to play football and that's how you get better. And I believe that. I believe that, you know, if you can get the, the more specific to the game, the more closely related to the game it is, you're going to have more transfer. Now, there's, that doesn't mean there's not uh, a time and a place for supplemental work, whether that be running without the ball, whether that be uh, weight training in, in a weight room, that I am 100% believe there's a time and a place for that and, and believe there's a massive benefit. However, the closer that we can get, depending on where we are in the season, the closer that we get to this, this, uh, you know, to the end season and, and to what the game actually looks like, the more transfer is going to actually carry over to them being being better footballers. Um, super compensation just goes back to that topic we just talked about about once you once you you know you train at a certain level, you give an overload, and then you rest well, and then you super compensate or become better, you have a higher baseline. And that's that's critical when you're talking about periodization, periodization throughout the day, the days, weeks, and months. And then the law of durability. That's uh, a law of durability is, is simply you know you want to build fitness over the long term and progressively, versus this short term fitness of uh, you know a lot of anaerobic glycolytic type type of actions uh, for a lot of successions in the days and weeks that are going to give you some adaptation, but that's not sustainable over the long term, and you'll see athletes fall off really quickly. So the law of durability, slow and steady, build it up over time to get some good central adaptation to help support those explosive actions um, as you go through your, your, your weeks and your months. So, you know, we talk about Without, you know, if you take, you don't need to be a physiologist to understand, you know, what you're trying to get after. But, you know, it's been proven time and time again that small-sided games, which is something I know a lot of, a lot of us do, uh, is a great way to elicit some of these physical uh, adaptations that we're after, all the while playing football and exposing them to the movements within football. So, to me, we go back to the thought, to the uh, statement of, you know, specific adaptation and post demands. This is a perfect solution of tying it all together. You're playing some small sided small sided games. You're getting a massive dose from a physical component. Three v threes are going to be different than five v fives, which are going to be different than seventy sevens and eleven v elevens. You know, depending on what you're after physically, you can now tie in tac tactically what you're after in, in one of these games, and you can always control it versus a work rest ratio. So, love these because players really enjoy it. You get a great physical. Um, you, you get a great physical response to it as well as you, uh, you, you can get your technical tactical and, and it's the game, uh, which is, which is as specific as it gets. So, and you can do it all in the time frame allotted 10 minutes. If that, you know, if you do about a 10 minutes of 11 v 11 or about of 92 times 90 seconds of three v three, you, you're really maximizing your time and efficiency and not overloading the players unnecessarily in a, uh, in a supplemental way. So, you know, the goal, if, if your goal is to, is to maintain the, the football actions, num, you know, the, the amount of football actions in a minute, then this goes back to their aerobic base work, okay? So, by doing 11v11, 8v8, and, and definitely down to 5v5s, you are going to be able to uh, chase the physical adaptation that is going to support the ability to maintain these, these football actions per minute. So, for, as, a, as a little example, Say 
you know, Tommy, little Tommy is, uh, is a, is a really good player and he's able to maintain seven actions, uh, per minute. And he can do that for 60 minutes and then he drops off. Well, if he can only do six and then five and, you know, those last, you know, last little bit of the game, his quality is going down. So the idea of these games is that we, we need to extend, we need to build Tommy up to be able to maintain those seven actions per minute through a 90 minute period. And that's maintaining the tempo and maintaining quality of actions. And you do that through those games. If, you know, 11, 11, 8, you need the players and sometimes some players need it. Some players don't. So other ways that we can supplement to try and give uh, individuals a bigger engine is to do some of this supplemental work, whether it be continuous or fart like training at specific uh, heart rate ranges, which is something that, uh, you know, beyond pulse, you know, enables, uh, players to do, you know, working within certain heart rate ranges for a specific amount of time can help build some of these central adaptations very similar to the 11 by 11 8 v 8 when you're unable to do those, those games. So if the goal is to, is to maintain better actions with, and, but have quicker recovery between the actions. So little Tommy does an action, it takes him five seconds to recover and then he can do the same action with the same quality. Okay, he can do that. Well, if maybe he can bump that up and recover in three seconds versus five seconds, that's gonna make him a more dangerous player because he has the juice and it, it doesn't co it cost him the same amount in three seconds as it did five seconds, but you know, when he's adapting to, to whatever the training stimulus might be. So for, for me, these, these games, 3v3s and 4v4s, um, elicit that response physically. Um, it gives you soccer movements in both accelerations, decelerations. Uh, it's super demanding, um, but also necessary for athletes, for, for, for soccer players, because they're going, they're going to experience moments like this in the game and they need to be able to turn over quickly. And this is the uh, 3v3s and 4v4s are the are a perfect way to develop this physical quality. And again, get the technical and tactical components, uh, with, with regards to, to, to football. And again, if you don't have, if you don't have the numbers and you need to get it in a supplemental fashion, you know, having athletes sprint 10, 20, 30 yards with incomplete recovery times or, or do some sort of interval, tra interval training where they're not fully recovered after each repetition is a great way to extend these boundaries to help have quicker recovery between actions. And then the last one here is that, you know, to produce better football actions, so in, to increase the quality of the action, so a 1v1 sprinting to goal um, is going to enable an athlete to be more powerful, sprinting the goal to finish off, to finish off a play. Um, this talks more about quality of actions, and anytime you're trying to improve, improve or extend the boundaries of quality actions, you always respect the work rest, issue, work rest period. So, um, you got to give the system time to replenish itself so that you're able to, to do another quality action that can be over 100% uh, or extend that boundary some. So that 1v1 springs a goal might look like um, that might look like a two to three second, a two to three second piece of work, and then you might give them a one to, a one to 10 work to rest ratio. Uh, so it's not in quick succession, you're given an opportunity to relax to, to be able to do that with either at the same or better quality to extend that boundary. And this is where your supplemental work in the weight room really, really helps um, to help bridge the, bridge the gap between the field or between the gym and the field um, to, get, to get that improved quality and, and force production, especially when it comes to, to spraying the goal. So, so what, this is the, the, the topic. I wanted to give a little bit of background there. Um, sorry, I know I'm moving quick. I want to make sure I don't, I don't miss anything. But uh, the physical management, you have your load and your fatigue management. Okay. Uh, so load management. Okay. What is load management? Okay. It's a training load is a vehicle that drives athletes towards or away from injury. And then performance at any given point is determined by the fitness level of the individual less fatigue. So what does that mean? That, that means that, you know, you have to, athletes need to be exposed to demands or need to be exposed to the demands that they are going to face. So if, an, if we know what the athletes elicit in a match, 
we now have a template to be able to begin to train throughout a week to build them up for those demands. And when we know that, that's really powerful information because it allows us to be objective in organizing uh, our technical and tactical drills from a physical standpoint. Okay. Okay. And load management is really important because the, the, the biggest thing is, you know, it, it, allow, it, allows you to, it allows you to see if the athlete is adapting to what you're giving them. Um, you'll notice a ton of fatigue if they are not. And we know that fatigue accumulation is associated with an increased risk of injury, uh, as well as way you know less than optimal uh, performance. So we want to ensure you know by doing by understanding where they are at any point in time, we can adjust trainings accordingly. Um, whether that's in you know put them in more of an underload, or we can push them a little bit to to, to get them to the point where they're bridging the gap and being able to handle that demand on, on game day. So there's two types of loads you want to think about. It's you have your external, which is what you do. So the distance you cover, the sprints, the number of sprints you do, the number of runs that you do at a certain, you know, meters per second. You know, these are all what you, basically the work that you do. And then the response to that work is what you call your internal load. So an example of your internal load would be your heart rate, okay? If your heart rate is above 90% for a great portion, then that internal cost to do the activity that you were doing, whether it's distance covered, sprinting, whatever it might be, is, um, is a lot. So the higher the heart rate is throughout, the, throughout a game or, you know, at these high, high heart rate zones, it costs the athlete more, which ultimately leads to more fatigue, which ultimately leaves uh, athletes susceptible um, during periods when they're in, in fatigue and they're asked to do some explosive actions. So understanding those two, being able to compare and assess at any point in time is critical so that you can adjust. So we've talked a little bit about this, but it, it, this is basically just showing, this is, sorry, I'm trying to get my little face out. Okay. This is basically showing when you train, you automatically drop. So if you overload, you automatically drop. And if you allow proper recovery, you adapt and you move this baseline higher. What happens a lot of times is people train, they drop. So the first two, they don't allow enough recovery time to come up with baseline. They train again here and they drop even lower. Train again here, drop even lower and so on and so on. So you can see it's a, it's a vicious cycle uh, uh, when you don't respect the recovery or you don't know where the players are coming from and you don't and you're not you're unable to respect the recovery that's required to get that positive adaptation that, that, that we're all after. So this is a really, I like this over here. Uh, the rest adapt or sorry, work rest and adapt is your recovery cycle. So you work hard, you rest hard, you get that adaptation, you do it again at a higher level. It seems simple. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that goes into it, but really, if, if that's if that's in the back of your mind, it, it provides a good framework to operate off of. So this is an example of a of a club that I worked with um, a little bit over the course of a year, and and you can see their match day minus fours, threes, twos, and their match day. So this is their average match day workload, distance, high speed running sprint distance, and then heart rate zones. So you can see what that looks like, okay? So they need to be prepared to do that. They need to be prepared to do that. So the idea here is I would argue, and I did argue a lot, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these metrics sometimes can be, you know, after initially it was way higher, but some of these things on your match day fours, threes, and twos, they look very similar, okay? When really these should be, you know, if this is, if this is, I would say this is, should be four, this should be six, and then this should be, you know, three, you know, so it's, that's what's called an undulating type of week, uh, where you're not having the same physical abilities constantly being repeated session after session. So, um, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't perfect by any means. However, you know, the teams had success. Um, they had some injuries, uh, and I would argue that maybe because they were had a lot of one-sided fitness going on, um, you know, throughout their training, you know, which, you know, uh, some 
young athletes can, you know, this can get covered up because they're young, robust, and, and they're not as susceptible as, as maybe an older player, uh, but it will catch up. I, it will definitely catch up. And I, I find that teams and I find moments that when all these, all these are not very similar from day to day, uh, but it's more of an undulating or a waving type of uh, way of accumulation. There, there's way more, uh, there's le- way less uh, risk associated with that. In my experience, in my experience. So the weekly integration, you know, this is just a little example. If you, if you train on a, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, here's a little, you know, your, your first day back is this little tactical restart session. That, that's your theme. Um, from a physical standpoint, you're looking at actions that are going to be, uh, you know, less actions per minute, but in, in bigger spaces and, and might, you know, have a less work uh, required so a little bit more coaching maybe a little bit more um, a little less repetitions on on your activities and then finally you know the, the, the tactical tactical or the tactical aspect of that maybe that maybe that's looking at a high block of press or, or a build up you know so a little bit of bigger spaces um, more you know more time on the ball ability to have more touches less dynamic in nature you know to bring them back you know, whereas that Second day after they got a little bit underneath them, maybe now is a time where you can push them physically a little bit, okay, and develop uh, a physical quality that you're after, whether that's high speed running, whether that is, um, you know, uh, you know, sprints with incomplete with incomplete recoveries. You can it, whatever physical quality that you're after. That's that's up to you. But you know, in a footballing aspect, you know any type of focus in the mid block and creative phases of training, um, you can have this. It's going to look a little bit more dynamic in nature, a little less time on the ball, um, a little more, you know, I don't want to generalize, but it can, a lot of times this looks a little bit more like stop and go activities. Okay. Um, and then that's the, the, the third session on a Thursday. It might be more tactical focus, getting ready for the opponent for the upcoming, upcoming weekend. And this is more of a, of an activation where it's, it's, it's intensive, but it's in an underload, so you know you're not uh, adding any excessive fatigue to the to the individual. Um, and again, you know this is a great day for for finishing activity. And you know if you're working, if you're in a defending a defending um, training focus, you know a low block, you know is also a great way to, to end the week leading into uh, leading into an opponent. So. It's all about, you know, what are your principles for your particular club or where you are and and where do you want to go? So I'll skip this because I don't want to run out of time if there are any questions, but basically, you know, supplemental training is important. You know, movement movement competency is, is the pillar of that. You know, following with, you know, once you move well, then you can move under, under some load. You know, and then then you do it in actual actual performance. Okay, where you're adding some speed to the to it as well. So these are a couple, uh, a few people that I really respect and have uh, learned a great deal from, whether that be personally or or uh, through the content they put out. So I always want to make sure I give credit where credit's due. And uh, without these individuals, you know, I wouldn't be able to uh, to speak on this topic for sure. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Sorry it was quick, uh, but I wanted to make sure to get to any questions uh, if, if anybody had any. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. So if you guys want during this time, you guys can send me some questions so we can ask uh, Steve and Mike. Um, if you guys want to, uh, Mike, you can jump in uh, whenever as well. So well. We'll give you the floor to you guys. I have a question already set up. Um, so a question, obviously, uh, Steve and Mike, you guys can both tag team us if you guys like. Um, we live in a U.S. society where it's, uh, the business sometimes overpowers and coaches got to get creative. So just your perspective on how do we as coaches properly incorporate periodization during tournament weekend, get creative ways or don't even participate in them, and just your explanation on why and how we can make and uh, benefit our teams from those situations. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for me, the youth setup is not set up, does, is not conducive to, uh, you know, a cookie cutter periodization approach. 
Um, so knowing that the environment that you guys operate in uh, is critical. So if you have two games in two days or two games in one day, you know, then you know that that is going to be heavy. And that is something that you can't change or have any control over. So that needs to be, in my opinion, my recommendation, that needs to be reflected in the training week. Um, because that's a reality of what you operate in. You know, the session that you wanted to push them in on Tuesday might not be appropriate because they're still recovering from the weekend before. So for me, knowing that you have to do that, and when those weekends are heavy, then adjustments in training just have to take precedent. You know, maybe it's maybe it's super tactical, you know, where there's a lot of stop and start and it's positional, you know, uh, you know, a lot of coaching, you know, um, and stuff that's not as demanding because, you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to avoid fatigue accumulation and, and you want freshness going into a game. So, and that's where, you know, I think coaches have to get a little uneasy because they feel like they need to do something, you know, well, there's a lot you can do without, getting that fatigue accumulation, there's a lot of, there's a lot of teaching that can go on. So I think just knowing that up front, um, that is, uh, I, I haven't found a better way to, to address that, but that is a reality of the, of the youth situation in, in this, in the States. So it's just one you gotta, you gotta deal with. Fantastic. So next, um, we have a question. Um, how does the belt compare to GPS H uh, heart rate that use sport bra in, in terms of wear and tear? And can you get live data with this system? Yeah, good, good question. I, I guess I, I should jump in on this. There's a, there's a few major differences. Uh, the first one being uh, that we use, we use the accelerometer, so it's not GPS. So it, it's, it's based on a step count. Uh, a combination of step count, stride rank, uh, stride length, uh, and step rate. So how quickly those steps are taking place. Long story short, we, we use a much, much more simple method of generating the same data. Um, simple in a good way uh, for a few reasons. Uh, the technology doesn't need to be as advanced. Therefore, the cost is significantly less um, compared to what a GPS system is yet it still gives you very, very similar data in terms of distance, the speed. Obviously, active participation is one that we, we created. Uh, the other big thing about it is that GPS you know, is, is very difficult to use indoors, yet half the country trains indoors for a significant period of time. So that's obviously a barrier to, to teams that are wanting to use uh, technology when they do go inside. And obviously, GPS doesn't have heart rate. If, if you do have a GPS system, and you want to get heart rate, well, you've got to get a heart rate belt in addition. Um, so again, with, with our belt, it, it, it's kind of got both. Um, plus, we're, we're, we're way less in terms of how much time, energy, and effort is needed to even capture that data. Um, the GPS systems, you know, you've typically got to set it all up. You've got to plug them all in at the end. You've got to download and recharge. We don't have any of that. We, we removed all of that. Because, again, that's a huge barrier to youth sports. Uh, coaches, we don't have time for that. We don't have uh, a strength coach, uh, someone in a position that might be like Steve's, who, whose big part of their responsibility is, is, is in uh, mobilizing that technology and, and getting that data. That, that doesn't work for youth sports. So, you know, we, we really built Beyond Pulse intentionally to not be like GPS uh, is probably the simplest way I can, I can answer that. Uh, yet still give uh, some of the data in just a much more simple, easy to understand, easy to collect, uh, and, and affordable, uh, ultimately, is, uh, is the biggest one, I think. Um, perfect. Um, Mike, we have another question. I think um, someone might have missed this. They said, is this available for college programs or just uh, youth clubs? Yeah, totally. We, we never built Beyond Pulse, full transparency. We never built it with college programs semi-pro pro teams in mind because we kind of naively assumed that yeah they've got budgets they can afford the stat sports or the player tech or you know uh, even the polar systems that are out there obviously we, we were horribly wrong um we, we we do have a number of colleges that that work with us not just because we're we're significantly more affordable but really because of that ease of use 
Um, and, and the time that it takes to use those systems is often not talked about. Uh, again, ours is, is in an instant. So it's, it's, very, uh, it's, very, um, it's, it's very convenient for, uh, for time. So yes, we, we do have a lot of college programs that, that, that use Beyond Pulse as well. Uh, it's not our prime audience. We, we, never, we never built it with them in mind. But yes, uh, we, we do work with a lot of college programs too. So thank you, Mike. Um, last question to wrap it up, Steve. This one's kind of, I think, targeted towards you. Um, how young is it good to start incorporating strength and conditioning um, in players' development? And yeah, why? I, think, I think the important, it's a great question. And, you know, for me, strength and conditioning, you have to define what it means to you. So for me, uh, strength and conditioning starts with movement. Okay, it starts with moving well. It doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're snatching, you're cleaning, you're doing all these Olympic lifting. It doesn't mean that to me. It means moving well. So um, if you have the ability to get with someone who, who understands that movement competency is the foundation of, of athletes and, and everything is built on that foundation uh, and the ability to express force and, and strength and power, um, for me, there's no uh, early, the earlier, the better, you know, because it's when you're young, your brain is very, uh, is, is the most malleable to, to learn these skills, these motor skills. So I think for me, the, it's, it's, it's super important to define what that means because a lot of people just think strength and condition, they think weight training. Um, but for me, the pre, it starts to take a step back. It starts with movement competency. And if they can smile, lunge, hinge, jump, land, cut, you know, these are all movement skills that I would classify as strength and conditioning. Um, when they can do that well, and then they can begin to load the patterns, you know, I think, I don't think you can start early enough. You know, I think, I think kids that are getting into gymnastics at five, six, seven years, I think is the best thing that you could do. Um, you know, karate, you know, jujitsu, I like those are movement skills and qualities that I think the earlier you get kids into that to learn, a, a large ver you know variability of these different types of movements it prepares them to be able to handle the variability that they're going to experience on the field later on so once they can do that well you know you can slowly begin to start to can they manipulate body weight uh, for repetitions and then and why for that can you put a little load on them um, I will say I will preface that with you know during the adolescent period you know uh, 11 to 14 for males and uh, you know I want to say 10 to 13 for females you know somewhere in that range they're growing so their brain they're constantly as you guys know they they look one day they look solid the next day they look like a draft you know and they're all over the place so you know you have to respect that and understand that it's going to take them a while to get the motor control that's that's required to be able to handle the stress of uh, excessive loading which which is going to make them susceptible from for injury, especially you look at stress related injuries like stress fractures and these types of things. So volume of work becomes very important, but I would always, I'll, I'll just bring it back to when they can move well and after they've trained the movement well, then I could slowly progress them into, into some sort of loaded movements I think is, is perfectly fine. That's my opinion. No, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much on our behalf. Thank you guys so much for putting in the time um, on during this you know, busy, crazy time. Um, we truly appreciate it. Um, and like I said, we, uh, if anyone wants to kind of know more about the uh, devices, uh, we'll kind of include it in the email. Um, Mike and Steve will also post it on their Beyond Pulse as well, the recording of the session too. So a lot of good stuff. So thank you, Mike and Steve. Again, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Likewise. Thank you.